Provide us the faith to follow him wherever his leading may take us. Today, as we worship together, allow this time to both inspire our spirits and to encourage discerning. May each of us be guided not by the desires of the world, but by the vision set forth in the life of Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Chili, that would be wonderful. There'll be an opportunity to sign up, and then we invite all of you 
uh, to for, come and participate. It is a wonderful uh, fundraiser for mission and outreach. And like always, it's just a lot of fun. So uh, be listening for more opportunities and information about that. Well, today we are going to be listening to words of scripture from Luke's Gospel, the fifth chapter. But the reading is going to be done with a little help. I'm going to invite Quinn to come up and share with me. Uh, the Boy Scouts, uh, today is Boy Scouts Sunday. And so I asked Quinn if he would help me with these words of scripture. The story begins this way. One day, Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. When the crowd pressed in around him to hear God's word. Jesus saw two boats sitting by the lake. The fishermen had gone ashore and were, and were washing their nets. <clears throat> Jesus boarded one of the boats. The one that belonged to Simon then asked him to row out a little distance from shore. Jesus sat down and taught the crowd from the boat. When he finished speaking to the crowd, he said to Simon, Row out farther into the deep water and drop your nets for a catch. Simon replied, Master, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing, but because you say so, I'll drop the nets. So they dropped their nets, and their catch was so huge that their nets were splitting. They signaled for their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They filled both boats so full that they were about to sink. When Simon Peter saw the catch, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Leave me, Lord, for I am a sinner. Peter and those around him were overcome with amazement because of the number of fish they caught. James and John, Zebedee's sons, were Simon's partners, and they were amazed too. Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid, for now on you will be fishing for people. As soon as they brought the boats to shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. May God's blessings reside and reverberate within these words. Thank you. I appreciate your help. Thank you. you join me in a word of prayer? Open us to your ways of love, kindness, and mercy. O oh Lord, open us and make us receptive. Allow for your gifts to dwell deep within us. This we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. We have a lot of current and retired educators in our congregation. People who have quietly been changing the lives of young people and in doing so, changing the course of history, in my opinion. <coughs> Not long ago, I was listening to a young man, probably mid-30s, talking about a moment in his life that he looks back upon as a turning point for him. He was in middle school, and in his social studies class, his teacher was teaching about the civil rights movement. But she was telling her class more about the lesser-known individuals that had been a part of the civil rights movement. And the way his teacher presented it was that these people were not superheroes. They were not mythical figures in some mythical, mystical moment in the past. They were common people, just like any of them. And yet they stood up at the right moment when they knew that they had to speak. <clears throat> well, that very same week that he was hearing his social studies <laughs> teach this, he stood up <clears throat> to a bully. He had watched this bully pick on others, and that day he saw him picking on a young kid. And he saw this as the right moment for him to stand up and do the right thing. No one else had ever stood up to him. No one else had ever said anything to this bully, but this moment was the right moment, and he did. And he said, I got punched for it. But to this day, he said, I never regretted doing what I did that day. One of the greatest gifts that teachers give, and I would suggest that any of us can give, 
is to give young people a sense of value. To say to them, you are someone special. And you have something special within you that is meaningful, that can be impactful, that, that can be transformative for the world. When I was working in Indianapolis years ago, helping run an after-school program, run at a Methodist church, but it was in an economically disadvantaged part of the city, this white, middle 20s, middle class kid had his eyes open. I remember one day, two of my kids in the program arguing. One of them was Hispanic, and one of the kids was, the term was white trash. That was the term given to kids whose families had moved out of rural Appalachia into the city. These two kids were fighting and arguing back and forth. Not a whole lot different than when I was their age, and we were often arguing one to another about who was the best at something. Now, I'm better at it than you are, kind of thing. But these two kids were arguing about who was the worst, who was the least intelligent, who was the ugliest. And they were claiming individually, you know, I am the worst. I am. I had never seen anything like it before. I never heard an argument like this before, but it became a lens through which I began to view that group of kids, and what I came to discover among many of them was self-hatred that was reinforced by a lot of cultural ideas and beliefs. These kids did not believe that they could achieve anything because they did not believe in themselves. They did not believe they had any value. In Luke's Gospel, we have this wonderful story of calling. It ends with a very successful day of fishing. But the night before, not so good. Simon, and we can guess both James and John, the brothers, had had a lousy night of fishing. But with the help of Jesus, they have this marvelous catch that, that wowed the crowd. But unlike other gospel stories, in this one, Jesus does not specifically say, come and follow me. It simply says that they got up and they left behind everything and they followed Jesus. I think upon reading such passages, our first inclination is to say, yes, I want to follow Jesus as well. And that's wonderful. And yet I, I wonder if that's really the place we should start. It's a lot like churches saying, this is our mission. Let's go and do it now. That's good. That's important. But I think sometimes before we grab a hold of that mission and start chasing it, we need to pause long enough to begin to venture down the road of asking the question, why? Why are we doing this in the first place? <coughs> Jesus calls disciples, but for what purpose? Why is he calling disciples? A number of years ago in the city that I was working in at the time, there was a, a push to, to expand the homeless shelter. There was a definite need, and a coalition of, of churches came together to try to do this. The opposition came from two city council people. And I remember one of the city council meetings where, right after one of the clergy had spoke in favor of expanding the homeless shelter, one of the city council people said, don't you think if God wanted us to expand the homeless shelter, if God wanted us to take care of the homeless problem, that in fact God would just do it? As if we were just to sit back and watch God do whatever God was going to do. Now I have about two dozen responses to that kind of thinking. 
half of them are not very kind or Christ-like. But what I can say is that I believe discipleship, whether I've read about it in the words of Scripture or read the stories of the faithful throughout Christian history, what I find in those stories are those who were compelled, who were so awestruck, who were so inspired by the life of Jesus that they were not thinking about just simply going to heaven. They were thinking about, how do I get a little bit of heaven to earth? Yet I believe there is, there is something else happening here, a point that is often overlooked. And yet for me, it stands out. In fact, I find that it almost leaps off of the page. <clears throat> the fact that God chose to call human beings, that God chose to call disciples, that God chose to call us. There is an assumption that is being made when you begin to think about God calling us, that God plans <coughs> To use us. And God is not just simply trying to get us to heaven. God seems to be suggesting that we have value when it comes to the work of God. And not as some last resort. God didn't look at some trash can in heaven that was piled full of possibilities that all had failed. And God said, well, I guess I'll just... Well, maybe try one last thing, these human beings, see if they can do something. No, I think from the beginning, God has been inviting people to participate. To participate in something incredible. And as I see it, we're the only plan. And if God is love, as Scripture tells us, and if we are to love one another because God first loved us, what would be the best approach. I doubt God wants us to just diagram it for people, or have machines build it, or hire a marketing firm to convince people that they want it, or invent pharmaceuticals that will rewire people so that they will believe they need it. If love is the desired end, if love is the desired goal, why would God choose any other means than human beings who were built for love. Even God chose a human being to be the fullest expression of love. John's Gospel begins with the language of the Word, the eternal Word. But this Word, this eternal Word, needed some flesh. The language of the word, the eternal word, that's a kind of an ethereal concept, a, a philosophical construct. But it doesn't end there. This word, this eternal word, took on flesh. And we know him as Jesus of Nazareth, a human being who had the capacity to share love and to receive love. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. says, Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. He goes on to say, Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Yes, only love can do that. And you and I, we are God's first choice in the matter. If love is the desired result, if love is the desired goal, then why should we think that the path would be anything else than love? And if the path is love, who else better to carry it than human beings who are capable of both sharing and receiving that love? God believed in those first disciples. And I believe that God believes in you. God values you. God trusts you with the task. God trusts you to be an agent, a, a proxy, an emissary of this love. Recently, I've watched three video clips, all of them showing a young person, in all three cases, a young boy, 
who's kind of small, non-athletic, and he's in gym class. And it's time to pick teams. And there's the two captains. I'll have you, I'll have you, I'll have you, going back and forth, back and forth, until it's just that young boy. In one of the videos, they choose a trash can before they choose that boy. And it finally ends with the two captains saying, you take him. I don't want him. You have him. No, you take him. I don't want him. For far too many people, this is their perception of life because it has been their experience in life. But God, in choosing a team for sharing love to the whole of creation, in choosing this team, God does not choose a trash can above you or above anybody. As I see it, God looks upon humanity and says, Tag, you're it. And we might say, well, which one of us, God? And God says, no, you, all of you are it. And I think it is within humanity's uh, inclination to say, but, 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 but God, I, you don't know my... And start giving a litany of rationale and excuses and reasons for why that's a bad idea. And God sees it all and says, no, you're it. There's no backup plan. There's no B team. There is no alternative. Cypress Creek Christian Church, you're it. You are not the last on some long string of failed plans where God is saying, well, I don't know what else to do here. Well, I guess I can use that church, Cypress Creek Christian Church, though I don't expect much. <laughs> no. I think God is saying, you're my first choice. In the same way that God said to those disciples, you're my first choice. Because there's no better choice than those that are capable of sharing and receiving love. Jesus will later say in his ministry, you, you will do even greater works than I. Let that soak in for a moment. I don't believe he was just saying it to those that were seated in front of him 2,000 years ago. Now I know that there are plenty of voices out there. Plenty of opinions, plenty of judgmental evaluations that want you to accept an identity of worthlessness where you just quietly and passively sit by waiting, I guess, to die and go to heaven. But in the Jesus resume, he called disciples. And he wasn't just lining them up to board the afterlife express. Jesus showed up that all might recognize what it means to be called, what it means to be invited, what it means to be given an opportunity to participate in something extraordinary, something that, that can change us and change our neighbor's life. It can change all of creation. Let's not just sit around until heaven Instead, let us be about the work of bringing a little heaven to earth. And we do so because God in Jesus said to humanity, you're it. You're my first choice. I believe in you and let's get to work. Cypress Creek Christian Church, do you recognize God's call? You're it. You're God's first choice. God is saying to all of us, I believe in you. I value you. You are gifted. Let's be about the work of not just waiting around until we die and get to go to heaven. Let us be about the work of bringing a little heaven to earth. You join me in prayer. God of heaven and of earth. There are days when it, is, when it is difficult to imagine why you are so interested in us. 
Each of us could provide a long list of why we would make a lousy disciple of Jesus. A long list of why we are unworthy of the task. Yet so much of this spiritual skepticism within us comes from the voices of those who want nothing to change, nothing to be transformed. Yet from the beginning, you had a heart for humanity. In Christ Jesus, you came to the world. You presented yourself to humanity and invited us to follow. To set aside all that hinders our capacity to be your agents, your emissaries to the world. Allow for your spirit to invite us again. To extend that invitation, that sense of purpose to each and every one of us. There's no backup plan. Your mission is love, and in Jesus we have witnessed that love. And today, only because you sought us out, we find ourselves ready to claim your call to be the disciples of Jesus, to be those who passionately and joyfully carry that message of love to the world. But before we take that first step, let us pause long enough to recognize that in that calm, you demonstrate your opinion of us, that you value each of us, that you believe in us, that you love us unconditionally. And it is that message, it is that belief, that value that you give to each of us that empowers us to rise above all the voices that are telling us just to sit back, do nothing, there's nothing you can do to rise above those voices and to be the people you believe we can be. This morning, God, we give you thanks for Jesus, for his resume, and for the way he taught us and for the way his living spirit continues to remind us of what is possible in and through your love. We ask these things now in the name of Jesus, in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, be thy name.
some translations say even the angels. Some say a little less than the divine. I find that so interesting in light of especially preaching at certain parts in Christian history, where sermons have said, suggested that we are all nothing but worms, <laughs> giving the sense that maybe we can wiggle our way through the dirt close enough to heaven. I mean, it just beats people down. And thank goodness that God is able to look past your wickedness, your horribleness, your whatever it is, and that God will let you go to heaven because of Jesus. Now, I don't want to suggest we're all perfect. I can look at myself and say, no, I know that is not true. Far from it. But there's a point at which you beat people down hard enough and far enough that they don't believe they have anything to offer. They don't believe that they have a gift to share. And I'm just supposed to kind of hang out until I die and get to go to heaven. Jesus called the disciples. And not just to line them up so that they could board the heavenly experience. He called them to do something special. We're called the body of Christ for a reason. We are the body of Christ in this moment of time. We are gifted individually. Those gifts come together in a special way that uniquely blesses the world in this moment. We have a message to share to the world. And we need to be clear that God has called us, God has empowered us, and God believes in us enough to say, I need you. And this is our moment. We can't put it off another week, another month, another year. This is our moment. As God, once again, as God does every day, is inviting us to believe in ourselves. Because God believes in us. And God is connected. And that's the reason, part of the reason, at least, every Sunday, we say this table is open for everyone. Because the last thing we want somebody to think is, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, I don't have what it takes. And that we just reinforce all those voices out in the world that say, you have nothing to value, you have nothing to offer. What we want people to understand is that God's love is bigger than all of that. And God wants us to come together around the table. And it is in that experience that we once again find who we are as beloved children of God. We find once again an opportunity to embrace our gifts. We find this chance to be God's agents of love in the world. Be reminded that God's love is unconditional. And it is that unconditional, unrelenting love of God revealed in Jesus Christ that brings us together around the table every Sunday. You are invited to share in this meal, not because you are worthless, but because God sees in each of us value, possibility of promise that has the potential of changing the world. For those seated here in the main section, you'll be invited to come forward to take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, and partake of the elements. Those on the back row and in the balcony, communion will be brought to you. Along with the offering trays, we invite you to place your blue cards along with your offering in the basket. Unless you think about joining, you can all say, keep that blue card and you can give it to me in the close of the service. And if you're needing gluten-free communion this morning, you will find it here in this tray. Let us now prepare our hearts and our minds for this wonderful moment when God affirms all of us in life. <laughs>
Because God created you, and God loves you. And God trusts you to be ambassadors of that love to all people. The work is hard. The work is demanding. So come, all of you, to this table and receive from God nourishment for the work. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, giver of affirmation and purpose, we are your instruments of faith. Help us empower others with your wonderful message of love, inclusiveness, and forgiveness. We ask these things in your name. Amen. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he and his disciples gathered in an upper room to celebrate the Passover feast. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after a blessing, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. And then he took a cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to the disciples and said, Drink from this all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is to be shed on the behalf of many. For the forgiveness of God, do this in remembrance of me. The table has been set. All is prepared. Come, let us dine together. <laughs>
you know somebody that might be interested in uh, seeking baptism this year, uh, looking both for a few more mentors, but also uh, young people that might be interested in going through that process and think about uh, being baptized. Uh, might be out there this Sunday and I believe next Sunday as well. And then I want to lift up next Saturday, May 30th morning to 1130. We're going to be up here having a little all-church work day. Some projects that uh, need to happen uh, around the place. Most importantly, the county's being very kind, but we still have a few things over in the gymnasium uh, that we need to get out of. So uh, if you wouldn't mind giving a little time on Saturday and joining us up here, uh, we would definitely put you to use, bring some gloves, wear some clothes you don't mind getting dirty. I invite you down to take the hand of somebody close and let us join together in our closing Gracious God, may your love and our lives come together in a life lived in love. May Jesus be our mentor and our model, and may the world see in us a life that is willing to put love first in all things. Amen.